Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today for another of the IP Watchdog series of webinars. We're happy to have you join us from wherever you may be. We have an interesting conversation here today about the, the PTAB. Um, we were getting ready to have this conversation, um, and then we had the uh, Open Sky decisions come out. We had another development in Open Sky yesterday. We'll talk about all of these things today, and really the, the focus is more or less uh, can the PTAB be fixed? Does the PTAB need to be fixed? What do you think about it? We have some poll questions uh, that will try and take your temperature along the way as we get going. Um, we don't have a PowerPoint today, which I always prefer, so we're going to focus on the conversation today. So if you have questions, please send us your questions. If you have comments, send us your comments. We'll, I'll weave them in as we have time throughout the hour here today. Um, this webinar is sponsored by the Innovation Alliance. We appreciate their partnership in putting this together. And Renee, are you here with us? Sorry, I asked. Okay, I'm Sorry not sure Renee it. is with I'm us. I'm here, Renee, I just hit the wrong button. Sorry about that, how are you today? So I'm going to be doing the introductions. And so today for our panel, we have Jason Sohi. He is the Director of IP Strategy at Netlist, where he leverages his experience prosecuting and litigating patents to creatively plan strategic alliances and partnerships, entity formation, asset protection, and intellectual property protection strategies. He also recently took on the role of an in-house counsel for an IP-focused tech incubator, where he negotiates IP property sales, purchase, and licensing agreements. He has experience creating IP capture and portfolio development plans and helping clients plan around contractual IP and formation-based risks. Next, we have Dr. Marion Underweiser. She has a decades-long career in intellectual property, spanning a broad variety of leadership positions and technology areas. Most recently, Marion was recruited by Waymo to provide IP support for clients working on aspects of self-driven technology as managing IP counsel. She also oversaw the IP operations of IBM's world-renowned research division and was IBM's senior counsel for IP law policy and strategy. Next, we have Judge Kathleen O'Malley. She is of counsel with IRL and Manila, where she focuses her practice on litigation consulting involving a broad range of subject matters, all forms of alternative dispute resolution and IP policy work. Prior to joining IRL, Judge O'Malley was a federal judge for more than 27 years. She was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in 2010 after serving on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio since 1994. She is also the first former district court judge to ever be appointed to the Federal Circuit. And finally, we have our moderator, Gene Quinn. He's a patent attorney and a leading commenter on patent law and innovation policy. He founded IP Watchdog in 1999 and since has twice been named one of the top 50 most influential people in IP and has repeatedly been recognized as one of the top IP strategists in the world. So you have a fantastic panel to listen to today. Back to you, Gene. Great, thanks a lot, Renee, and thank you all for joining us here today. What I'd like to do is, before we dive into the conversation, which we already really started in the green room before we got going here, um, as you can imagine, this is a pretty lively conversation. Um, I'd like to go around the horn and get everybody's preliminary thoughts, uh, big picture thoughts on the PTAB. Um, and it can be really any anything that you wanna say whether it's good, bad, ugly, is it meeting its goals, is it not meeting its goals, or, or what have you. So we'll go in the order in which Renee introduced you. We'll start with you, Jason. Big picture, where do you want to start the conversation today? Well, I think uh, my presence on the panel is to just kind of add a voice for an operating company that's being subjected to what we think are some significant abuses through the IPR system. and that's all implemented at the PTAB. I feel like um, it has the PTAB accomplished its goal. My understanding is the goal was to uh, cull bad patents, whatever that may be. Uh, at the time, there was significant concern about enforcement of bad patents and, and trollish behavior and things of that nature, um, perhaps a knee-jerk reaction, because the things that have played out for us over the past 10 years since the NIA, uh, you know came into being, uh, played out very differently 
for the operating company. And uh, it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about now, having been part of Netlist uh, for a little bit here and learning about their story and just being a part of it now and seeing it develop in a, in a surprising and uh, recently shocking way. So, I, you know, happy to talk about that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. We'd love to have you dive into that a little bit more. And we will, throughout the hour, dive into the, the impact that this has really had on an operating company um, that, that you know, owns patents and is just trying to navigate its way through the system. So th thanks for your initial thoughts there. Uh, Marion, your, your, your initial thoughts to get us going here today. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the uh, opportunity to participate. I just wanted to um, clarify one thing, which is that I am currently retired from corporate practice. So I just wanted to clear, say that. Um, when uh, so I that means you can tell us what you really think, right? Yes, yeah, I can tell you what I really think. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I used to work at IBM, when we were, uh, when I was, when the AIA was being written, um, I can tell you that the purpose, in my mind, the purpose of these proceedings was really to create an alternative, kind of a more efficient, you know, intra-agency alternative to litigation. And um, one concern is certainly the, uh, you know, making sure that the patents out there are valid, but other concerns involve having a proceeding that that is run fairly to all parties to, you know, that fulfills the purpose of the patent office, um, but also, um, uh, but also considers the interests of patentees and the challengers. And we were working off the, um, the background of having inter-parties re-exam. And we're really trying to, uh, you know, honestly to tweak that to make it look a little better as an alternative. And I don't think that's what's happening with IPR at all. It's it's really an off-ramp to litigation. It seems to run um, in, in parallel. And uh, we can talk about the reasons for this. I know we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what's going on with the PTAB, but um, it is, it's definitely true in my mind that it's not working the way um, I envisioned it. Yeah, and that's that'll be interesting to dive into a little little bit more. Um, and because I almost think it's it's not so much an off ramp for lit it's an on ramp for litigation. I mean, this is where litigation starts, right? I mean, you know, and um, I, I I don't think that there's a lot of people who were involved on day one that that could have predicted that this is what the PTAB would have would have become. But um, but you know that that's what I hear at least. So, but before we go too much further down that path, uh, Your Honor, it's a pleasure to have you join us once again. Thank you so thank much you. for being here. Um, your initial thoughts. Well, you know, part of the problem is that whether they're meeting their goals partially depends on how you think those goals are supposed to be defined. I mean, if you go back to the legislative history, uh, it looked like the goals were to provide this alternative mechanism, less expensive mechanism to, to deal with the most obviously, and I, I use that word, it's not really a pun, but you know what I mean, the, mo the, clear, the clearest invalid patents and to have those sort of the low hanging fruit, you can get rid of them without a full blown litigation and all that entails and all the costs of discovery, the jury issues and everything else. But it was also to strengthen the good ones. So if there's a legitimate challenge, but the, a patent could be fixed um, with an amendment process that, that that was also what the reason was. It wasn't just to get away, get rid of as many patents as possible. At least that's not what I understood the explained goal of the legislation to be. Um, so uh, to me, it, it just seems like the, based on how it was all implemented, the, the IPR process has become sort of the epitome of um, you know, unintended consequences. I don't think that anyone ever envisioned uh, that it would be something that, that patent owners would would dread so much and that would abuse them so completely. Um, whether it can be fixed is another question. And I'm, you know, I, I probably have a little more faith in, in, in that than some people do. But, um, but I do think that, that right now that the, what the IPR process is, is gotten out of hand. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would agree with that, you know, and I, I, 
and I've written that uh, the the P tab just needs to be thrown away and it can't be fixed and all that uh, other sort of thing. And having said that, you know, I I I I've never been in favor of abolishing the the P tab. I've been in favor of abolishing what the P tab has has become and throwing away and and almost starting over um, because. I, th I think we need to have a, a PTAB. We have to have a way to, to do this. And I think that there, there can be a way, and I'll share as the hour unfolds my thoughts as to how to reform the PTAB. Um, but Marion, I was, I was intrigued by what you said, and maybe we can start there, but, you know, because too often I think people forget that this is intended to be you know, the IPR at least, you know, which is really what we're talking about when we talk about the PTAB. Uh, it was intended to be a a better, easier, streamlined, more efficient uh, inter-parties re-exam, which just didn't work. Inter-parties re-exam just, you know, nobody liked it. It took seven, eight years sometimes to come to conclusion. And, and by then the patents had already been licensed or expired or, you know, invalidated or, you know what have you um have, have we gotten it right i mean i, I mean i think if we're going to talk about can the PTAB be fixed that was the goal was to make inter-parties re-exam better is this better uh well i don't think it's better um um the the partly bringing that up is so people understand what was the organic process of trying to come up with with IPR at the very beginning in the AIA there was some discussion about do we really need a second window right there was discussion of first window and second window um second window means you know can you have an a uh, challenge where the challenger stays in the proceeding you know throughout the life of the patent i mean that was really discussion or some length after first window right first window would be right after the patent's granted and that proceeding, that inter-parties re-exam goes a certain way. I mean, it looks like re-exam. There's a back and forth with the examiner. There's amendments. It takes a while. Um, there's a fairness achieved by that, right? We know ex parte re-exam works pretty well. So you see, if you achieve a certain fairness by having that careful consideration of amendments and going through the back and forth. Um, the problem is, as you said, Gene, if it takes a really long time, nobody's going to use it. Nobody did use it, right? I mean, it, people right. would go through litigation. No litigations were ever stayed for inter-parties re-exam. And so it wasn't considered, it, it wasn't really that popular. But the question is, how many knobs are you going to turn to make it, you know, more usable maybe as an alternative, but without making it disrupt the litigation process, right? I think maybe some of these problems were foreseeable. I think a lot of people think that they were. I think some of them were not foreseeable. To me, the biggest thing that um, became, the, the thing that became obvious here was that the IPRs operate too much like the litigation, right? That maybe it's the time limit, Right, maybe maybe it, it has to do with how that knob was turned. I don't know, but they they operate too much like litigation, and as a result, having um, a lower burden of proof and an inability to amend, you you end up with a result that is so much worse for patentees in the course of the IPR. Right, I mean, all these claims are found, it, all the all these uh, petitions are instituted. The claims are found invalid. And so it it ends up looking a lot better for challengers than litigation, and it it creates these other problems, right? If it looks a lot better, more people are going to use it when they litigate, et cetera. So if you thought when you were writing the statute, well, if I have a one-year bar and I have this estoppel or I have that, I'm going to constrain it, it's it won't work. Because now you've turned this into a different kind of a uh, an animal, right? You've gone, it, you you kind of went from one end of the spectrum where it wouldn't be used at all because of the time, primarily because of the timing, but also because the outcomes really weren't so favorable <laughs> for challengers. You had amendment, you know, and you had this the back and forth, but also, um, uh, you know, on the on the other hand, the current situation, and we can talk about what's causing it, is so 100. 80 degree on the other side that that it's now pushing the limits of what could be sustained by the structure 
Right. So it's just, it's so that that's why I think it's it's not functioning the way it was. Uh, people thought it would. Yeah, you know, and um, <coughs> I, I I would agree with that. And as you were <clears throat> just talking about that, so la last night I didn't I didn't sleep very much at all. I just laid there and I was thinking about you know in part about this webinar, <clears throat> and I thought to myself, you know, and I I, I almost felt embarrassed as I was laying there thinking about this like why didn't this come to mind like what like 10 years ago but why why are we doing it this way is what popped into my head you know it's like what we're trying to do is ostensibly get rid of quote unquote bad patents and we can talk about what that means and that bad you know ugly is in the eye of the beholder beauty's in the eye of the beholder right but let's put that aside for a second let's let's say that we can all uniformly agree on what is a good patent what is a bad patent we're trying to get rid of the bad ones why does it take a three judge panel 18 months to do that you know if, if what we're really trying to do is get rid of the low-hanging fruit which is what we were told you know get rid of the stuff where oh you know there's a late arriving piece of prior art or the examiner clearly made a mistake or whatever you know just look at the prior art, look at the claims, and is it good or is it not good, and and be done with it and move forward, right? You know, I mean, it's and and so it struck me when you were saying why that that thought came to mind is is it too much like litigation and too little like examination? Judge, what do you, what do you think? I mean, because you've actually sat on these cases where they come up to the the federal circuit, and I know when they get up to the federal circuit, a lot you, you guys are probably more focused on was the law right and what's the law going to mean for the next case and the next set of litigants and so forth. But if you were starting from scratch, how would, would, would you think it would be better to have it be more like examination or more like litigation? Yeah, that's why it's kind of funny when you guys say it's too much like litigation because a, lo a lot of other people say it's not enough like litigation. In other words, because you do have different burdens of proof and at least in the beginning, you didn't have the same claim construction right. rules. Right. Um, I think if it's supposed to be a, an alter a quicker alternative to litigation, um, it, that it, it can be... Um, it can be more streamlined than litigation, but you have to have the basic fairness and 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 process. I, yes, I my vision I was that been it, troubled by the fact that the the rules are different, like the laws are different, the burdens are different. Right. So that well, that's partially a function of, of Administrative Procedures Act. I mean, Congress could have could, could have said that that the review is not going to be under APA, and the Congress could have. Uh, created a different burden, um, could have said clear and convincing evidence, or maybe the first director could have said clear and convincing evidence. Um, it is a problem, but there there are a lot of issues that were not properly thought through. And, and I think that part of the reason is that for years, the PTO never acted like it was an agency subject to uh, the Administrative Procedures Act, and then all of a sudden it is. And, and, and with all the benefits and all the, the encumbrances that, that go along with that. Um, so I actually think I had assumed it was going to be a lot more like the ITC. In other words, very fast, not the full, you know, not juries, not the full um, uh, direct and cross examinations, but enough like litigation that parties would feel like they got a really fair opportunity to make their case or to refute the case. Um, so I had I had envisioned it being more like the ITC than like the process that it is. Uh, but, you know, that's that's the problem is we all had basic understandings about what was going on. And obviously the message wasn't getting out as clearly as it should have, um, because no one really knows exactly what Congress's goal here was. Well, I, I suppose, I mean, I think the goal was to get rid of patent troll problem, right? To get people not to be sued, I suppose. Um, but they didn't but, They didn't put a whole lot of meat on the bones and they left well, it. And that whole problem was something that was ill-defined and, and, yeah. and, and not very well supported by evidence. So in other words, if that's what you think the goal was, then, then the goal was actually not a very real one because they were going mm -hmm. after um, sort of a boogeyman. 
uh, rather than focusing on what they really should be trying to do. No, I absolutely agree, but I can tell you for sure that that was in the minds of the people who were putting the maybe not you know Director Capos, but after Director Capos left, um, you know the minds of the people who were the judges there. You know, it famously, uh, Chief Judge Smith said that you know if we're not doing some death squatting, we're not doing our job. I mean, they really did believe that that was what they were supposed to be doing. But Jason, let's br let's bring you in here because you know we're talking about a lot of the legal stuff here, um, but we haven't talked yet about the real world consequences of what this means for 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 companies like like you all, and and I, you've got a pretty compelling story about what's been going on at the PTAB, and I think maybe we should lay that out here and, and put that into the equation so we can talk about this and the impact a little bit more informed yeah unfortunately it's compelling <laughs> right wish right it so but, you know, as you say that you know what i always had, I had when i was in law school i had a, a law professor i think it was in torts said that you never want to have a case that winds up in a case book <laughs> Um, yeah, similar story in my school as well. I, I we have some experience with both the re-exam process and this story. We've got a couple of issues. Um, one I'll focus on is just our 912 patent. It's uh, it's something that uh, relates to a technology we started early on. The company was founded 2000, but we started having disputes and and, and issues mid 2000s um, with with Google. So we filed a lawsuit 2009. They re-exam us and you know, um, Dr. Underweiser, you're saying that cases may not get stayed for IP, you know, inter partes re-exam. Well, ours, ours did, unfortunately, and it got stayed in uh, 2011. And so we're we're still pre pre AIA. The thing enters into re-exam uh, on the 912 patent. Uh, AIA passes, so we get the PTAB. Everything's created. Uh, re-exam uh, turns out to be an affirmance. Gets appealed, validated with the PTAB board 2016. So we're six years out, we have our first, you know, double confirmation, everything's good. Goes back down, multiple attackers pile on again, uh, gets re-examined further. Another PTAB board affirmance 2018, submitted to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, finally found valid a <laughs> fifth time, 2020. Case reactivates 2021. And then what happens? An IPR, uh, inter partes, you know, review gets filed uh, 2021 uh, by by another actor. Uh, in this case, it was from Samsung who filed a DJ action on the patent, uh, admittedly at uh, Google's request, and then fo followed through with an IPR on the single claim that was of most importance to Google. And so now we're facing down that, waiting that, waiting for that inst institution decision to come down the pipe, which should be this week. So. Hopefully we get a good result, but um, that like very brief history is a patent that's been through the ringer in terms of its review and vetting process, found valid multiple instances, and is subjected to another attack. And now we're 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 wondering whether the you know petitioner here, Samsung in this case, has gotten a sympathetic board. We're subjected again to another attack. We don't have quiet title on this thing. There's no end point for us to say that a patent won't be challenged ever again, despite its the rigors of its, you know, of its history. We have another, the 833 patent is another patent we got. I mean, these are just numbers right now I'm talking about, but as data points for you to consider. I mean, it's been three IPRs, three petition denials, and now we're on number four and it got instituted for what we think and what we've argued are largely the same issues. So yeah. from our perspective, for this to be an alternative to litigation, it's not, it's a, it's just a part of it now. It is an integrated part of the litigation process for anybody that chooses to be able to, you know, infringe and has the pocketbook to keep these things going. That's just an alternative and it's, a, it's more efficient for them to do it this way instead of having to license. So that's Jason, the have you have you reached out? I mean that if if nothing else, it's very clear that this director wants to hear 
wants feedback and it and takes it very seriously. Have you reached out to the PTO and, you know, or tried to get an audience with the director? Um, I mean, she's not going to interfere in a particular proceeding necessarily, but she's going to listen. We haven't reached out to the PTO directly. Um, <laughs> we actually were uh, opposite Ms. Vidal in one of our cases. And so we want to talk to her, but we're waiting to see what the decision is and give the board a chance to like do the right thing here. We're hoping that that's the case, that that's what happens. But we have our process in place for maybe a pop review or something, but that's not off the table. We want to get this idea before her so she can consider it because she does seem, at least in that respect, to have a more of a direct hand in dealing with these egregious issues like open sky, but we feel like ours is uniquely situated just because of its particular history for at least the 912 and these other ones we've got. We have 13 pending IPRs right now. It's ridiculous. I mean like every patent, if like if we have a if we have if we have a patent that's part of a standard and nobody wants to license it, they'll use it. And then what do we have to do? We have no alternative. We were supposed to be an alternative litigation. We would love to have some way to have an open licensing discussion that doesn't seem to ever be the case because it's better to just try to take shots on goal and kill the patents. So now we're faced with a never ending stream of it, IPRs. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I, what I what bother what bothers me in particular about this and what I think is is interesting in looking at the you know the statutory provisions and thinking about what's wrong with them or what what might improve them is that there are a lot of provisions that have discretion for the for the office, right? There's a lot of provisions that rely on director discretion. Um, you, it's common sense to say that you can't just keep attacking a patent over and over and over and over again and expect to get a fair result. You're not going to. Human beings are doing the evaluation. They're looking at prior art. One of the reasons, it, it, it's, there, there isn't a, it's not like if the patent's valid and reasonably should be valid that you can attack it a billion times and it's going to survive. These are all, you know, human uh, proceedings where we're, all, you know, people are looking at them and looking at them. Okay, maybe now with 2020 hindsight, I think that's obvious. I mean, eventually, you know, you, you how is a patent going to survive that? You know, it's it, you, you, it's the reason why you can't keep bringing civil suits or criminal suits. You know, at some point you're done. Okay, you've had your chance and you're done. And the, you know, the PTAB should be in a position to say, no, you can't file 30 petitions on the same day on the same patent. I, I don't, I'm not even going to listen to you anymore. Right. Well, I they mean, were. They they did under under Director Yonku. That's exactly what what they did. You know, so I've got a, I've got a, a couple thoughts here because I want to dive deeper in into this. One is, um, you need to write an article or somebody at your company needs to write an article, obviously approved by your attorneys, uh, published on IP Watchdog. And you know, one of the things, and you know, I'll say I'll say it out loud here right right now is like, we know who reads IP Watchdog. You know, and you can't necessarily pick up the phone and call the decision makers in advance but you know if they're going to read the wall street journal there's a reason why people post op-eds in the wall street journal right you know and not to say that ip watchdog is the wall street journal but i do happen to know that we have pretty great readership you know and you know so you need to get your story out there and not only necessarily that the people at pto will hear it and see it but then and not just you jason but anybody out there that can hear the sound of my voice if you have stories, you need to be publishing these in IP Watchdog because then they'll become a part of what I say when I speak, what, when Judge O'Malley speaks, what she talks about, when Director Capo speaks, when Director Yonku speaks, when you know Judge Michelle speaks, when Marion is speaking. You know these will all become a part of of our story. You know, and this is uh, things that we're we're, we're missing. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that I want to talk about Fintiv. You know. Because Fintiv sort of became, you know, a big nothing burger after a while, right? When they were saying Judge Albright was setting these unrealistically fast trial dates. Now, there, there's all kinds of, and I like Judge Albright. I think he's a great guy, and he certainly knows patent law, and I think he's a good judge. And there's all kinds of reasons why you set a quick trial date if you're a trial judge, because it, 
things. And when I was litigating, I, I'm not sure, you know, if cases either settle in normal course of negotiations or they settle on Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. when you're ready to pick a jury on Monday, you know? So you have to have people's feet to the fire, right? Um, but once they said, okay, well, don't look at the trial date that's set, you look at the, when it's actually gonna happen. Well, okay, so Fintif falls off the radar as being relevant, right? But why, why? We're talking now in Jason's case about patents that have been thoroughly litigated, thoroughly. We don't have to question about whether the court is gonna get to it before the PTAB has, because they already have, they already have, right? The okay. same that way. Gene, let me way. just push back a little bit. The word fintive has become like the word troll. It, it's right. sort of lost all meaning right now. I think that the reality is, is what Director Iancu was concerned about, and I think that, that Director Vidal feels the same way, is that there are just some cases that shouldn't be instituted based on the totality of all the circumstances. And if you get away from the trial date and that, that everybody was focusing on, but you but you understand that there need to be a number of considerations that go into the institution decision. And there has to be discretion to say, there's just been too many of these, for instance. Um, and that, they, it, that the director should be able to say, or the PTAB uh, should be able to say, this one just shouldn't be instituted. And I happen to know that there is a lot of focus at the PTO right now on the question of, of how you lay out those standards. I don't think they're gonna do away with discretionary denials, they're just going to um, attempt to define what they are and to apply them in, in what are truly the most appropriate circumstances. Well, um, and that would be great because, you know, there's there's also on the, because the, the way that fins have made sense to me, and I don't know, you know, and obviously whenever you start with these new tests, it, it, it never had a chance to develop, right? I mean, it was dead before it really kind of developed, I think. Um, but there, there's a big piece of managing the, the resources of the agency, right? So why does the agency have to look over and over and over again at the same patent? Why, you know, that has been thoroughly litigated and maybe in Jason's case, they've had re-examinations and they, you know, and so forth. Um, it, it seems to me to be, unless there's some kind of, you know, smoking gun that for whatever reason has heretofore not been available, you know, don't 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 look at it any anymore you know and and th that's that's a very important thing that i think it, it gets missed now the counter to that argument is well every defendant should have the ability to challenge a patent now those two theories of law are at loggerheads the one is is that this is defined in the statute as a property right which has to mean that it's owned at some point and you can't have property without a quiet title and then the fact that at some point, you know, I might get sued and I want to challenge that when I haven't had my day in court. But, but you know, that, that to me seems like, well, you, you haven't had your day in court is the patent, go to court then. The patent office has done their, you know, the, we, we, for good, bad, or indifferent, we've already looked at this six ways from Sunday. We're, we're not going to get it. If we got it wrong, we're going to get it wrong again. You know? Yeah, but let, let's go back to the, title of this this talk right? right can it be fixed i think part of the problem is that of, of course you can go to congress and get a fix but that's never going to happen right we con congress is talking about it but but there's never it took seven years to get the aia in the first place if we want to get a fix and we want to get a fix now we have to allow the directors you know, both Director Iancu and, and Director Vidal to, to begin the fixes. So Director Iancu changed to the Phillips standards. Um, and it would be great if it if it was, you know, sort of locked into a rule so it couldn't be changed back very easily. Um, but right. but so there are there are there are tweaks. He he did something about the amendment process um, that I was so concerned about. Um, and but but then he tried to do something about over institutions with Fintif and before, as you said, before it ever got a, a chance to play out, the attack was so powerful that, that yeah. you know, you, you couldn't even see whether or not he, I mean, he didn't even have the opportunity to do exactly what I think Director Vidal is doing now, which is to look at those standards and to see how they're playing out in real time and, and maybe tweak them. 
Um, so no, we do I, I have to, I, 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 don't get me wrong, criticism is part of what I've, I've spent my life doing, but, um, but I, I do think that, that we need to find a way to fix these things. And one is to allow some of the changes to come through policies and rulemaking, comment on the rules if they come out, and, and and we you know they say they're coming out right they're gonna they're gonna do um, comment and rulemaking and so everybody should comment and and let those comments play out I mean even under the APA failure to consider comments is is a basis to set aside a rule is arbitrary and capricious so um, you know make sure the comments are there and don't just assume that that you know, everything's going to go your way at the end of the day if you don't explain to the to the office what it is uh, you think needs to be done. No, no, I, I agree with every everything you just said. And and Mary, let's let's pivot to you for for a minute. And and I'll throw this out to all of you too, if you, anybody has anything to say. So, in the spirit of can it be fixed? One of the things that I have always said is just take fewer cases and dive deeper to make sure you get them right. You know, and and I think that the patent system would 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 survive much better and thrive if there was more certainty and people felt like the PTAB is there to correct mistakes. They're not there to Monday morning quarterback and say, oh, I would have done it this way, not that way. So, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. You're touching on exactly the right point, which is that there's there's certainly all of these consequences we're seeing around the outside, right? We're seeing all these things happen where, you know, the IPRs are all ha happening in conjunction with litigation. We see abuses. We see these third parties come in and 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 try to be, you know, get, you know, use uh, strategic behavior and they're gaming the system. What we really need is to have the outcomes be, you know, accurate and not so one-sided towards the challengers. They're not coming out right. And I, that's, I agree with you. I agree with you, Gene. If they look, because they're running a little bit more like litigation and not like examination, they can't, you can't have a result that's tw twice as bad for tw patentees as it is in litigation. It's not gonna work, right? They can't, if they're gonna grant every petition or they're granting what 70% of petition, the last time I checked 70% of petitions and then invalidating at least one claim in at least like 80% of the granted petitions, of course you're gonna get this problem. Everyone's gonna right. try to get into the IPR. You're gonna have all these problems around the edges. So if you can enforce, and I, <clears throat> look, I understand that the, that you may need legislation for the burden of proof. I don't know if you can do it any other way. I think you need to have clear and convincing be the standard. I actually think that's really important. But I mm -hmm. think if you could somehow filter at the front end, if you could behave more accurately as a as a PTAB. No, I don't um, think you need legislation for the burden of proof. You need legislation for the standard of review, uh, which itself, see, it's, it's sort of, it's biased toward, the system is biased toward affirming the PTAB when they act and the PTAB's uh, system is biased toward um, invalidating patents because of the burden of proof, because of the standards that they employ. And, and so it, it becomes this cycle. Yeah. I, no, I just and I, add, you know, I, I feel ahead. like, yeah, but part of the problem that, you know, I, I, what you guys are talking about in terms of the nature of the way that the things are taken up, I feel like there's an, there's an inherent problem with the way that performance, you know, for APJs is considered or measured. Like, I don't know that it needs to be done the way that it is with decisional units. You know, I feel like that's something that might be an issue that could be addressed without legislation. I'm, I'm not sure because it's a personnel management issue from the executive branch is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Folks in the APJ, <laughs> APJs are, I mean, tantamount to like an executive employee. And it's not like the same thing as a judge. Let's like calling balls and strikes you have somebody that you know may need to make a quota or something to get there like an 84 decisional unit threshold to be considered a fully successful judge you know <laughs> it's like something like that is kind of a problem i feel like in in my in my view because that incentivizes more attacks and then more attacks it with the incentive to actually do something to act to do something with what you have in front of you means that you're going to get percentages like that 70 percent institutionally yeah. I mean, so, and it's, 
seem to matter. Yeah, I think the federal control. circuit has looked at that, and in a case they said that that is not that doesn't happen. The government accountability office has looked at it and said that agreed with you, Jason, that it is a it is a concern. It is it is a, a problem potentially, and uh, and I can tell you, and I can't cite to who and how I know, but it is a problem. You know, and, you know, I have a lot of respect for the PTAB judges. So, I mean, I, I understand that it's a, you built in this institutional bias and maybe it's better to get rid of it. Um, I would have to see a lot of proof that it's actually happening. Um, I, I think that, it's certainly that, not happening with all the judges. I mean, you know, and it's like the, the examiners, you know, when we say, oh, there's bad examiners. Well, they, that's a true statement. But, you know, there's 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 8,500 examiners, you know, there's probably like yeah. one or two percent that have abused the process over the years. But yeah, the, consistency is an issue. We need to have, you know, the, the fact that one panel would would deny institution uh, on the exact same patent and another panel would grant it is is problematic. Um, but but again, that's something that with with director oversight could be taken care of. And the other thing that's a problem too, along the same lines, is I think it's fairly well known in the industry that if you want to get something instituted, you don't just file a single IPR; you file multiple IPRs against the same patent on the same day, and the odds that they'll be instituted go up dramatically because when it gets instituted, it, again, it's the quota game. You know, you know, essentially they're looking at one patent, and the, they'll get three X, four X, five X or six X worth of credits for marginal additional work because all the prior art's the same, yeah. the specification's the same, et cetera. You know, and yeah. to that point that we're, we're seeing some problems just with the fact that multiple actors can jump in that may not even be involved in any litigation at all. Like that you get situations where it will pass muster and then somebody else swoops in and takes another shot. It's just, the process is set up to allow for multiple shots on goal. So yeah, the absence of standing and the absence of standing is an issue and or of a standing requirement and, and the joinder process is, is nutty. I mean, the statute does says that, say that the time bar doesn't apply to joinder, but if, if the party that's time barred then is the only man left standing, if the other party either settles out or, um, or if, for instance, if, if they're sanctioned out, uh, then then the joined person, they're not, they don't become all of a sudden not time barred. They should not be allowed to stay. They should not, I frankly don't even think they should be allowed to participate, but that's a separate question. Well, it, it is, no. but it's common sense. I mean, this is like civil procedure 101, you know, you, you know, and it's not even, it's like, you know, they give you a reading assignment in the summer before you start law school, you know, statute of limitations. I mean, but Marion, you wanted to jump in and, and say something. Yeah, you know, and, and it's sort of going back to what we were talking about before a little bit. There is a larger question here about the accountability of this agency, okay? And I think that you were talking about this a little bit, but I think one thing to consider here when we talk about how are the PTAB judges evaluated or what's motivating them, there is a larger issue at the PTO. You know, people come in at the front end and spend a lot of money to get patents. Okay, and there is an examination, and the examiners have whatever tools they're supposed to have, and of course we all we all want to make sure they have access to the prior art and they can do the job that they need to do. Um, at the back end, though, the PTAB is finding such a high percent of those patents and those claims that are grant that are granted to be invalid. There there should be a form of accountability there at the PTO, right? There should be an explanation essentially, right? If the PTAB's right, what's going on in, in examination? How do we get that right? And if the right. PTAB's wrong, how do we improve the, how do we improve that substantive evaluation at the PTAB? But I think that, you know, I don't know the best way to do that. I mean, that I would say ideally some, you know, congressional pressure, public pressure, or congressional pressure. But I do think that there's an accountability problem here. The metrics should link to one another. It shouldn't just be, well, how do I motivate my ALJ employees? The PTO should be looking at this holistically. Um, and, you know, I don't, 
I don't have necessarily an answer here for how to do this, but I do think that looking at both sides of it is something that the PTO is responsible for. Yeah. So now you also brought up the statistics and you brought them up in a, a little bit of a different way, but I wanted to bring them up. You know, one of the things that has frustrated me since the very, very beginning, you know, when you, you you'll we'll come up with these statistics to say, you know, like 80 plus and at times it was 90 plus at times it was even 95 plus percent of patents that there had a decision in by the the board were were finding at least one many claims usually invalid you know and then you look at the the pto statistics and they show something that's diametrically different than that that reality that we all know happens and the problem is they don't honestly report their statistics and the quickest easiest way i can show you and explain this to you is is that they consider when you do break down how they report them they they report a settlement as a victory for the patent owner and now a settlement is a capitulation for the patent owner because it has been instituted meaning depending upon whether it's a reasonable likelihood or it's it's likely invalid there is some kind of finding by a panel that says that this claim is not likely valid and shouldn't have been issued whatever the phraseology is for the standard based on whether it's a pgr or an ipr so the the claim is in in serious doubt and we all know what that means if there's a written decision once the judges have made that determination they very rarely switch their opinion later on in the case. Then there's a settlement. Well, what happens then? The patent owner gets to keep the claim, so the patent office views that as a win. Well, you get to keep a claim where the board has just said it's not likely valid. That's not a win for the patent owner. So when, when they come up with these statistics and say, oh, well, the patent owners win all the time. No, they actually don't. They don't. And the that is just... I, I either they do, it's 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 it borders on fraudulent you know because when they first started doing it it's like oh, it could have been an oversight but for 10 years i've been pointing that out and for 10 years they keep doing the same thing you know and that's just one example of how they misreport what's really going on you know so it, it is extraordinarily frustrating because then you, you go to these hearings and and you know congressmen and women they 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 are focusing on different committees and different issues so if the somebody from the patent office comes and says oh well you know hey only 30 percent of the patents that get challenged are invalidated you know and, and that person is just sort of they're on this committee but they're a ranking member or something on agriculture and that's more important to them you know they're going to hear that statistic and it's going to oh well it's not so bad you know the, wow. These statistics make a big difference. Um, Jason, there was one question. I'll come off my soapbox for a minute. The one question I, I want to get to you for sure before we pivot, I want to make sure we get to open sky at least a little bit. Um, but can you give us all an idea of what this cost is? Um, not just in terms of uh, opportunity costs, which are huge, I'm sure, but in terms yeah. of cash layout i mean what what is this costing you guys in terms of opportunity and in terms of real hard money I can, can i just add one part to that and sure. i assume this whole time jason you've been paying maintenance fees on those patents right <laughs> yeah yeah but i mean yeah the the comparatively though yeah like the maintenance fees are a drop in the bucket i mean for, right for, but for, it's for just insult the, to injury yeah, yeah it is, yeah, it is. Uh, i i'd say that um god quantifying this i mean in terms of just the legal fees alone you know it's it's in the it's definitely in the six figure range easily it can be upwards of seven depending on what types of challenges and the problem we have with multiple challenges with multiple parties at the same time like things like that can drive things up because then you have to unpack what seems to to us to be facetious arguments so it takes longer but the opportunity cost i mean shelving the patent for this time period you know, going through the risk of having it be invalidated just completely undermines the value of a portfolio. And it's fundamentally, our business, we're, we develop memory. You know, we're, we, we make products, we don't scale, 
like competitors. We are not big like Samsung or Hynix or Micron. We create the innovative aspects that go into this stuff. So innovation is what we do. The only thing that protects us is patents. And when patents are attacked in this way or just able to be invalidated, just give it time, then what are they worth? It turns from something that you know you're you're supposed to spur investment and have further investment through R and D. It doesn't happen. You're buying a ticket to litigation. That's what you get. So in terms of the overall loss in value, well, if we don't win, then it's like a complete and total loss in in all aspects because <coughs> that's what we're forced to do. We have to fight all the way to get these things through the ringer and then to a process that might lead to some kind of license down the road. It's unfortunate, but the loss of value, I mean, just the legal fees are six, seven figures looking at it for like one of these things, I think. And then you've got 13 pending. Plus, if you're talking about, if you wanna have a standing requirement, you're gonna, you're gonna get start, start having DJs filed. So you gotta deal with the litigation thing because they'll do the DJ and then they'll file the IPR because they want that IPR so bad because it's just easier for them. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it'd be tremendous. In, in terms of like a stock price, we're publicly traded. So, I mean, like a, a, a good example is, um, I think at one point when we had that good decision at the federal circuit, we our stock price went up, market share was like 2 billion. So a huge number, but just tiny compared to these people that, you know, these entities that are that are infringing. And it's, Unfortunate because when the when the case got restayed again, and uh, that DJ got filed and the IPR got filed, I think our stock price dipped and we lost something like uh, I don't know, maybe it was like 600 to 800 million in valuation in like one dot in like one one action of the, uh, of the uh, filing of this thing, just because of the type of situation that you're faced with when you have an IPR. So, I mean, quantifying this, it's it's, it's it's almost impossible, but I would definitely put it at the lifeblood of the business. So whatever the business is worth is what this is worth. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I feel like uh, another part of it that, that you know, that, oh, that this echoes open sky, that the process itself is allowable to have these things like the, that would not have happened. The open sky people would not have taken the shot at doing this, like holding the patent hostage if this wasn't something that was a a reasonably sure thing. Their strategy was to file the thing and then and then say we'll stop if you pay us. It's like so you I have, know what I mean? So yeah, no, I do. I have two thoughts on the whole know. open sky <laughs> thing. And let's kick this around before we run out of time here. Um, f first off is um, when Director Vidal decides in her decision, she found that they were engaged in extortion. Okay, so that they were doing this for extortionary reasons and purposes, and yet they were allowed to, to stay in the IPR, and the IPR was allowed to continue. So, as far as I can see, there were really no sanctions. There, there's, there's, there was no downside to the act of extortion. So, there's, there's, there's that which is just hard to believe, um, and, but. but what that message is and what that says about all the other stuff that goes on and what 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 how you view the PTAB. I mean, the problem with the PTAB is, is you know, we want to believe and because we, we all at least at least I, I know Mary and, and uh, Judge, we all know people that work at the, the, the PTAB from examiners all the way up to the 10th floor. We you know, and they're, they're our friends, you know, we can't, we can't be in this industry that long and not have a lot of friends at the PTO. And their hearts are in the right place. They want to do the right things. The PTO is full of people like that. But then you see these layup decisions, you know, or you see like ethical violations where somebody was formerly employed by a company and was deciding dozens of IPRs with that company involved. And it's like, you, you scratch your head at these things and it's like, well, these are the things we see out in the open. What's going on behind the curtain? And I think, you know, it, it, Director Vidal's decision in an Open Sky did a, a terrible disservice to the PTAB because now I, I don't know how you can take the PTAB seriously at the moment. You know, Marion, you first, and then Judge, if you have thoughts. 
Yeah, I mean, we 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 talked about some of these some of these issues, but you you can't in situations like this in particular, you can't only be thinking, oh, there's compelling merits, and that's the only thing that's important. Um, <clears throat> the uh, you have to be capable of dismissing these these cases because they're they're not they're not brought uh, legitimately and they don't fit into the box, and they're certainly not serving the interests of patentees, frankly, or the public. And if you allow these to go on, right, you're you're spawning business models by doing that, right? So people are going to now look for you know third parties are going to look for ways to to capitalize on this kind of thing. So you don't want you don't want to encourage. This, I think that you know you need to think about other interests besides just wow I saw some arguments that look good for invalidating patents. And and one thing that I'll just that I would just mention, it's maybe a little bit of an ancillary issue, but if the patent office sees that there's art they didn't think about before and they think it's really, really important to reevaluate this patent, they can do it using ex parte re-exam. So you don't have to put put all your eggs in the IPR basket when when you have a situation that doesn't serve anyone's interest, that involves fraud or involves you know bad behavior, you don't have to pursue that IPR. Um, that's what's important to the office. Yeah. Now, Judge, I, I know you, you probably are unable to go too deeply into the Open Sky case uh, for potential conflicts with your, your current firm being involved in some ways in, in that matter. So I won't ask you specifically about Open open Sky, but maybe, I mean, you, you've been around D.C. For, for, for a long time. And so maybe just ask you about the, you know, the the perception of 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 the PTAB in general. I mean, um, when you see these, whether it be a, a, you know, like the PTAB finds that an MRI machine is abstract, which clearly an MRI machine is not abstract, you know, you have these ethical problems and you have, you know, you could go through the, a list of these things that you just want to scratch your head about. I, I mean, what, what does that do to the the credibility really you know th these things go in cycles in the beginning i think everybody said we need to defer to the ptab we need to defer to the ptab and you know these are the experts and and you know even experts make some really bad mistakes sometimes and so i, I actually am kind of surprised that it's come so full circle that that the the criticism of it is as powerful as it is um but i i also believe that that at least the director is committed to trying to fix it, you know, incrementally maybe, um, but to trying to fix it as much as as possible. Um, so, so maybe that's a good place to we're we're, I mean, we're right up against the the end here. Um, there, there is one thing that that I wanted to make sure that came out that we haven't had an opportunity to to come out yet. Um, and I'll just read the quote, and if somebody wants to take ownership of it, they can take ownership of it. It's, um, the only entity that doesn't believe the PTO deserves deference is the PTO. And that's a quote that came up during our pre-call. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let, uh, if the person- I admit that I said it in the pre-call, but it, but it was somebody else that said it um, at GW last week, and I wish I could actually say who it was but i i said that was one of the most clever comments that i heard <laughs> yeah and i think i think it is it, it's 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 true you know it's it's they they it, so i'm gonna i'm gonna start this and then i'm gonna i'm gonna i'll end it so i'm gonna cheat and, and i'll have two but the one thing philosophically if the patent office could really come to terms with the fact that they need to have one door in and one door out you know, and that door has to be, we are a patent granting authority and we occasionally make mistakes and we will fix those mistakes, but you can't have a hit squad or a death squad, whatever. And, and it astonished me that, that they liked that moniker. And I still think they do, um, that doesn't show any deference at all to the 8,500 plus examiners that are really doing a lot of work and by and increasingly over the years i think have done a much much better job um you know and there's a lot of reasons why you know with the searching tools and and so forth 
of finding the, the be best prior art. Um, but they got to give deference. <coughs> That's number one. They got to be, they got to <coughs> give some deference to their own people. Um, so, but if there's one thing that you could fix at the PTAB, what would that one thing be? Jason, let's start with you. Well, I got like a lot of alternatives. I like that stronger patents act. I think the one thing I would fix. Oh yeah, we. I is, didn't. Uh, I promised polls, and I didn't do any of the polls. Yeah, I think that I. I think that the the one. If I could only fix one thing, I think I would do something. Just popped up on my screen. Yeah, no, go ahead. You go ahead. I'm gonna okay. try and get a couple of polls in while we <laughs> while we wrap up here. But go go ahead and. Give your sure yeah i think if i could pick one thing it would be um something that i don't think the stronger act touches on what it does is sounds pretty good to me but um having some kind of time bar on the ipr process now i know pgrs are limited in their in their time unlimited and really effectively in their scope but the fact that you can come back time and time again with multiple actors um to do to take your shot is a is a very fundamental problem with this. It's turned it into like a super examination that you know is a is a matter of course with litigation. It's a it's a factored in cost, and it doesn't make anything more efficient. It just seems to draw the process out and make it more uncertain, which is inherently bad for business. So I mean I I think it it comes down to that fundamental thought about what are patents good for. And if they're a laudable property right to hold, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's a sentiment shared by, by anyone at the PTAB right now. I'm sure there is, but Matthew Vidal's uh, you know, opinion on Open Sky made me a little worried, worried about that. And she's saying that, you know, it's just something you can do to clear entry barriers as an excuse for bringing IPRs if you don't have a patent infringement defendant in play. I, I just think that the time bar itself would be one thing that would go a long way to giving you certainty. So did you want me to say, Gene, what I would change, the one thing? Can you guys hear me? I yeah, I can yeah. now. I I've got a big Hello, can you hear me now? <laughs> so yeah. Yes, I can hear you, Gene. Are we still here? Yes, I am. Okay. I um uh, not sure exactly what what happened there. Um Can you can you see me? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I got interrupted, uh, interrupted my stream for a minute. But Miriam, what is the one thing that you would do to fix the PTAB? Uh, well, I think a lot of the problems stem from these results, the substance of results. And so I would try to make sure that um, uh, things were fairer to patentees. And I think I mentioned this before. So I think if you're applying the higher burden of proving invalidity, really a clear and convincing standard, I think that would be very helpful to patentees. The results would come out better, and I think it would reduce the pressure that creates a lot of these other abuses. And, and Judge, you're, you're, you're one thing. Yeah, well, I, I, I might have said exactly what Marion said, but that's I'm glad she said it because then I can say something else. But um, I, I, I think I would also, uh, change the joinder rules so that joined that bar, time barred parties should not be allowed to join it doesn't even make any sense to me and um and you know if i can throw one other one out there i think there should be some kind of a standing requirement even if it's a relaxed standing requirement yeah standing would go i think a, a long a long way to um to fixing a lot of a lot of different things the one thing that i have written about uh, a, a while ago and i should probably dust that off and, and beef it up is is i think that the role of 
the, the PTAB, the role of the office. Historically, district courts have looked at the examiners as, as the experts and the PTO as the expert agency. So we have a model, uh, whether it be in you know, bankruptcy court, uh, where the bankruptcy judge will hold the hearings and essentially a district court judge will then sign off on, on the, the decisions, or um, you have sometimes you know, a magistrate or a, the judge will appoint a special master uh, to deal with certain issues. I, you know, and this would require obviously a change in the statute. I, I, I think I, I don't. Th I think I'm almost certain it would. But I would see if we, if the PTAB is going to be an adjunct to litigation and trying to make it more efficient, and why not have the PTAB play that role of working with the district court judge to deal with the issue of of validity or invalidity, and then have it go in the same way it would from like a bankruptcy judge up to the district court judge to review the decision, you know, and the more the, the more work that the PTAB has done to the, the show their work, the more likely the district court judge would go with the PTAB decision um, and so forth. But that also requires a streamlining of the, of the rules, you know, so that it actually is, if it's an alternative litigation, it has to be litigation burdens, it has to be litigation, um, uh, rules you know it has to be clear and convincing evidence and so forth so where i would come in on the first poll we asked you is somewhere towards the bottom i don't want to abolish the btab because we need to have something but it needs to it needs to be substantially fixed or redone given what we know and i think a long way go, to go a long way to doing that would be is the patent office needs to be a little bit more transparent about what's going on but does anybody have any final thoughts? Yeah, I think the patent office is trying to be transparent. Have you ever seen any agency director do as many reach outs and talk no, to people? No. And that, so I think, I think I, you're, I'm not saying they're perfect, but I, I, I do think we have an obligation now to mm. respond when they say, give me comments. <laughs> no, I, I agree. But like, so when I say transparent, like, for example, there's all kinds of situations, and I know we're over time, but I just want to, there's situations where the patent owner will get, because I always get email when this happens, the patent owner will get a positive decision from the PTAB, and then the next time that there's a hearing or decision from that particular panel, the, the judges who sided with the patent owner are, are mysteriously removed. Now, there may be as a reason, maybe they retired, maybe they've died, maybe they've you know, transferred, maybe they, you know, whatever. But in in the Article Three court, there's a footnote explaining why the panel con constitution has changed, right? And the, the PTAB doesn't do that, you know, so then it, it leaves you to your imagination. And so there's a lot of these little pockets of where there is no transparency. There's a lot of transparency, I think, at the, on the 10th floor. And then I'd like more transparency or maybe more honesty with the statistics. But um, so, so that's what I that's what I have to say, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> but I do think you're right. I think Director Vidal wants to do the right the the right thing, and uh, but how she how the whole open sky thing happened, we'll we'll see where that ultimately plays out. There was just another decision in that. Yesterday, uh, there's another director review now pending in Open Sky, uh, so we'll see what happens there. But uh, final thoughts: going once, going twice, going thrice. Yeah, gotta fix something because patents are starting to get attacked too much. It's they're going to lose value, and it's going to be a big, big problem if it isn't already, which it seems like it's pretty much there. So yeah. that's I agree point. with that worldview. I agree yeah. with the world. We've got to, we've got to protect our patent system. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for spending a portion of your day with us, and thank you for sticking with us, even though we went over. Um, your Honor, Miriam, Jason, thank you, and uh, we'll all see you soon in another webinar. But bye for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you.